Before we start, I don't agree with or support a lot of the political beliefs and decisions of who to follow on Twitter of the Witnesses creator Jonathan Blow. But in my opinion, it's undeniable that he is very good at designing games. Despite whether it's right or wrong to separate artists that we don't think are good people from their work, I don't find it possible to really talk about The Witness without Blow and the legendary prestige he has attained with Braid, The Witness, and his many lectures on game design. The man has had a profound impact on the landscape of games. Despite his recent comments, his words about what games are and can be for vessels of stories and emotions still hold a monumental weight for me and many others. I don't think that The Witness contains hidden messages of Blow's politics, just his thoughts on games and the industry they are created and experienced in. I will be mentioning Blow and his part in The Witness for this video, I won't be talking about his personal life as it's relevant to the interpretation. Cool? Cool. Let's begin. Hey there. The Witness is a 2016 game by Thekla where you wander around an island and solve maids puzzles on grids. To many, this is all that The Witness is. And I completely agree. This is all that The Witness is. The Witness is a game about perspectives. If you found this video already knowing about the main discussion surrounding the game, then you've probably heard variations of this sentence dozens of times. And yeah, The Witness is about perspectives. You wake up on an island, solve some expertly crafted cereal box mazes full of intricate little rules that come together to create mind-blowing, awesome subversions, and also this stupid thing. That's the game. But then, as you walk about the island, you can line it with a camera just right in certain places and bang! Here is the trick of the witness, the core, the revelation that Jonathan Blow has spoken about extensively in his many talks on designing the game, the single moment players have held entire conversations over since the game's release in 2016. And look, these are still just lines. What if you go beyond that? A tree full of faces, these statues and shadows when lined up just perfectly make beautiful little scenes and moments of epiphany. This lake, these rocks, some roots reflected in the ocean, and then further, after beating the game and riding this elevator returning to the start, you notice something you would never have even registered back before your journey began. And so you walk out, hear the credits blankly spoken through some audio logs, and eventually the game shifts to a real world video of a man finding circles and patterns in his real life. See, says the game, notice what you missed, notice the shadows of branches, notice the delightful perfect circles, notice the reflections made by the marks and tables made clear in the light of the sun, the symmetry, the colours mixing, the way your physical world is put together. That is the witness. That's what you witness. And cool. Great. But what from here? It feels like there's more to this island a shape intrinsically linked to your physical perspective, but not bound by it. The Witness is a game about meditation. Yes, there are audio and video logs hidden by just a camera turn away atop churches and upon wrecked boats, stuffed with quotes from scientists to poets to philosophers. Stories and thoughts on humanity, wonder, awe, one quotes Einstein, another describes the overwhelming feeling of looking down upon the earth from a space station as you yourself stand atop the mountain, looking down upon the island. These scriptures, as some of them literally are, begin as mysteries, and there must be a solution for them, just as there must be a solution for these carefully placed statues. It's a puzzle game after all. But as you ascend through the perfectly measured and calculated regions of this island, the audio tapes and stone people, frozen in thought or introspection or prayer, all fuse into a homogenous melting pot of ideas and perspectives of the world, the actual real world, rather than any law-based story. The game does have law though, kinda. While hearing these voices that once recited poetry and science break into characters and talk for themselves about this library of world readings they are collecting is surprising, it's just another layer higher into this piece. Others like you drifting through the mesh of philosophy. There is no right answer in these texts, and that is what I would argue is the epicentre in this intricately woven web of ideas. 
one audio tape reads an atheist extract that is too critical, too dismissive of other perspectives in order to support its own. And the voices, they reject it. Ideas are separate, can be almost contradictory when forced into pairs, but as a collective bloom of perspectives and conversations, the work appeals to every philosophy simultaneously. By being about philosophy. Together, they are not about single ideas, but the humanity of difference. The humanity of finding your own meaning and sharing it with others to build them from each other. The game ends with a ride on an elevator that rises straight out of the mirror ocean. As you float upwards, Charlie in the great glass elevator style, the game spouts lines from the Diamond Sutra, one of the most influential scriptures in Buddhism. A star at dawn. A bubble. A bubble in a stream. In a stream. A flash, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud. A flickering lamp. A flickering lamp. A phantom. A phantom. A dream. And a dream. And a dream. The excerpt itself is another meditation, a small shard of enlightenment whispered by an overlay of voices as you soar over the regions of the island and the puzzles you solved reset one by one. Memories of your journey a collection of your influence cast in prose. You end up back at the start, and now, having witnessed a new perspective of perspectives, you notice a detail you never considered before, and you reach the end where a man unplugs himself from a simulation. This simulation is the island, a constructed reality where you solve puzzles and gain a heightened appreciation of the way the world can be perceived. And now you are all the more free. The Witness is a game about prisons. Yeah, I, I know. And I don't want to change any of that. Just. Tucked away deep. It doesn't have to be drama, it's just reality. These recordings are part of an endeavor built by human beings. And they aspire to truth with a capital T, but we also have to remember that they cannot actually get there. So, we wake up on an island, completely alone, trapped even, if we want to go that far. And in this first area, the fort, we learn how to draw lines onto panels. We draw lines and open a door. We draw lines and stuff happens. This is the extent of our interaction with the witness. Exiting the fort, the world opens up and we stumble forward, further into this island. Somewhere subconsciously, we immediately understand that there must be an escape from this place. Maybe it's the way this opening section conditions us. The fort has one exit, opened by multiple switches, just like the island and its multiple lasers. Maybe we notice the game's supposed structure when we activate our first laser, and it aims itself at the landscape dominating mountain. Or maybe it's just an ingrained fact at this point, that there will be an end, an exit from every game, whether that be a game over screen or a stunning climax into a credit roll. And so we press on, the mountain in mind. As we progress, the game starts building up our mental database of different puzzle types, like developing rules in a new language at the various locales of the island. This ocean stack introduces symmetrical boards and colored dots, the swamp these Tetris blocks, the mangrove tree houses have colored stars, a monastery uses branches to show the correct paths through completely blank mazes. 
the rules begin to collect together into an intricate collage of interlocking systems that allow you to push further into the island. The answers to the grids are revealed in an instantaneous point after the laborious task of sifting through the possibilities. It's as if we already knew the solutions and the game only cleared the mist. And it's probably around the time of activating our first or second laser that we decide that we might as well see what is up there. The twisting path skyward still feels perilous despite the invisible walls preventing our fall. The rigid, narrowing cliff face to the left pushing us out while the winding road thins and crumbles and intertwines with tree roots. The ground shifts from deep green to fading yellow to dust to rock to thinner grass to darker basalt to snow along with the rising sound of the howling wind and the dropping level of the sea. The altitude difference is explicit everywhere we look. At the top is a lock slowly opening with each laser armed, expected. And some more of those mysterious statues, like the obelisks and audio logs. We've seen them before, but we don't quite know what they mean yet. All will be revealed eventually, of course. Oh, and there's a panel. So then, what now? We've beaten the game, ridden that elevator, and maybe we've gone back and reloaded a save or started again to find a few more of those... things. The bleeding between panel and world. The game puts us back at the start anyway, so there must be more of them to find. Each one found and subsequently traced illuminates a face on one of the jet black obelisks scattered around the island. The obelisks don't react much when we find one of their secrets. They don't answer, just record. But the feel of the puzzles themselves have a lot more satisfying energy than their panel counterparts. They fizz and shine with energy while we loop the curves and complete the circle line end shape that we've become so familiar with. They don't open any new doors, don't give anything more than that little counter by our save files. But they must have a reason. They have to, with this much effort put into their design and feel. And they do. At some point, could be now or could be later, we're going to see something, and it's not going to be inside the game. We could be outside, in our homes, or anywhere really. It's a normal space, maybe a familiar one. Better if it's a familiar one, not designed by some insane game dev. And we see it. Circle. Line. End. When we play games or consume any sort of media, really, we notice similarities to things that happen around us. Funny references, if you will. Bugs? No way. It's like Hollow Knight. Blood? Blood. Bloodborne. Bloodborne. Born of the Bloodborne blood. But never before has something from a video game ever been so overtly present in the physical world around us. It's not just a reference, it's almost exactly like how it is in the game. It is how it is in the game. There's no flashing shimmer, yet they are there. A little epiphany. And now something in our mind has given way. Some little door has been unlocked, and the light inside has begun to seep through. In Ted Chang's incredible sci-fi short story, Understand, Leon Greco, a freelance hologram artist, is given an experimental new drug called the K-Hormone to repair his severely damaged brain after he was frozen under ice during an accident. The hormone successfully repairs his damaged neurons, almost too well. The regrown neurons have many more dendrites than normal. In clinical trials with healthy humans, this effect wasn't present, the hormone only repairs damaged neurons. But with Leon's severe injury, the new strength of the reformed brain cells begins to affect him. He becomes smarter. He is able to recite long strings of numbers from memory. He can multitask effectively with equal, full focus on everything he is doing. And excited by this new discovery, 
the doctors offer him a second injection of the drug. Still reveling in his heightened intelligence, Leon agrees, wondering if his mind can go further. His goal for where he wants his newfound intelligence to take him is constantly leaping forward, outstripping all other wants and needs of his life. He begins to devote himself to searching for gestouts, as he calls them, a totality of knowledge about the nature of the mind, made of glorious patterns and monumental structures. No matter what I study, I see the patterns, I see the gestalt, the melody within the notes, in everything, mathematics and science, art and music, psychology and sociology. Eventually he escapes the prying eyes and ignorance of doctors and psychologists, far beneath him in understanding his own mind. He hides himself away from the world to continue the venture for these gestalts. He begins to develop a new language, not one able to be spoken or written, but a language for thought, an ultimate tool to see the ultimate beauty of the reality he is adrift in, his own mind. We say we hate it, joke about how this game has ruined my life, I see them everywhere. But we love it really. This game, without any tangible emotion or story, has got us, and now we want more. Because we know this is not the end. The end was not the end. There are still some video codes left to be unlocked in the theatre room beneath the windmill. There's still a wide cavern somewhere within the mountain we can just barely see through cracks in the ground. We must be nearing the end now. The next layer then, if we can separate out each level of perception our brains slip through, isn't even about lines. Now it's just the environment. Tiny details in the way the island is put together. Branches of long dead trees are twisted into faces and birds, visible when we stand in the perfect spot. Shadows of statues act out new variations of the scenes that they portray. Decorations and concrete and nature join and layer upon themselves and intertwine to create motionless little snapshots. These freeze frames assemble themselves from the polygons of the game as we scour for secrets. More tiny intricacies to find, analyse and devour. And it's amazing to us. Each and every angle we could look at, at every spot we could stand, in the twisting interconnectedness of the island could reveal new logs, codes, lines and images. The whole thing is just a canvas of magic eye puzzles. We immerse ourselves in this game, a giant puzzle for us to solve. We open that door a little wider. The lake at the centre of the island is actually a map of the entire game. The code vaults, lasers and obelisks were marked there from the very beginning. Eventually we crack the problem, find the line, and get into the mountain cave. More line puzzles await us, though they feel like a distant memory now. A challenge exists down here too, along a subterranean river. A race to beat a randomly generated series of panels while in the Hall of the Mountain King heightens the experience to an almost boss fight level of attention and panic. The reward is one last code for the theatre room. There is another code, handed to us just for reaching this new underground environment, but it doesn't fit into the hexagonal array of the theatre. Maybe instantaneously, maybe hours later, after every nook and crevice has been impressed in our minds as if branded with hot iron, the lock is found for the key, and our hearts and minds can't help but race as we trace the path and create one last line. One that we obscured with our ignorance when we first left the fort. Here is an environmental line that actually does something beyond the action of tracing. A door is formed in thin air. We are transported to far above the island in an impossible hotel lobby, higher now than even the peak of the mountain. But soon the formal architecture falls away into a void and a spiralling path and a doorway. This is it, the final revelation. We watch as a weakened man shuffles himself off a sofa after being inside the island simulation for countless hours. He makes his slow way outside the development office of Thecla, the game studio Jonathan Blow created to bring his visionary idea to life. The man, Blow himself, stops every few meters to notice a circle, or a line, just as we do when living our lives now. He doesn't speak, he just sits outside lays down and stares upwards as trees and buildings encircle his vision. The world turns to blue. 
This is a completion of ideas. We are shown ourselves. Someone who carries the island with them everywhere they go. Someone who doesn't set it down, even when they turn off the game. And then the game closes itself. One question seems to remain. Do we take this finale? No. The Witness is a designed reality. Every video game has a purpose behind it. Developers try to give players the experience they want to give. They have designed the game to do this. But The Witness is the event horizon of designed. The island lays still, without me, nothing happens. Trees sway slightly and water laps in a breeze, but that breeze is constant and absolute. These towns and facilities are desolate. The only humanity is in the statues and they only accentuate the stillness. I think that if this island was left to rot over hundreds of years, it would still have that clean, dustless sheen when I returned. There is no decay. As has become clear to me over the course of my journey, every minute detail has been considered, valued and placed diligently to form each puzzle in this nothing shell of a conventional game world. It's not alive. There is nothing moving I can react to in The Witness, and yet, it's so enthralling. The game knows how excruciatingly it's been planned. The Witness took seven years to make, its original epiphany was conceived long before that. Inside the mountain there are walls plastered with concept art for past versions of the island. A jumble of TV screens play the promotional long screenshots used to advertise the game. Architectural models for unused or old designs of buildings lay on workshop benches. In the hotel above the clouds, sketches for puzzles lay discarded on desks, and innocent enough paintings hang on the walls, until you notice the neon panels. The work behind the facade is so blatant, but even then, such a tightly tuned game like The Witness has limits, or at least, seems to. I begin to click on anything remotely circular in the world, just impulsively. And the game knows this, it always knows. It wants me to stumble blindly past breaking point. There are actually no circles in the witness. None that I can't interact with, that is. They use triangles of constant diameter to make the wheels of this minecart and jagged rocks instead of smooth stones for a juggler's balls. Yet I begin to see the curves and lines, even when they are not there. And this isn't in real life anymore. This is in the game, within my place in the work. Anything could have something. Anything could be lying. And now, more desperate than ever, I find the purpose. The real centre of the witness is the fourth of the six videos beneath the windmill. Most of these videos are lectures. People preach on about emotion, spirituality, science, love, and finding wonder in the universe. More interpretations of the world to sort through. But the fourth was the hardest to find, hidden after that time challenge. It's another lecture one first presented on March 23rd, 2002, at the Game Developers Conference in California. It was re-recorded in 2010 to be used in The Witness, six years before its eventual release. It's been a crucial part of this game from very early on. In some regard, Blow built the game upon it. It's Brian Moriarty's The Secret of Psalm 46. How many of you here have personally witnessed a total eclipse of the sun? To stand one day in the shadow of the moon is one of my humble goals in life. The closest I ever came was over 30 years ago. On February 26, 1979, a solar eclipse passed directly over the city of Portland. I bought my bus tickets and found a place to stay, but in the end, I couldn't get the time off work. The Secret of Psalm 46 is about the pointless mainstream use of easter eggs in video games. It's also about hidden meanings in literature, planetary orbits, conspiracy theories, Shakespeare and ciphers. The lecture rolls on and over itself in an hour-long, devastating journey. It first speaks of people who love to hide things in their work. The champion of the late Baroque, J.S. Bach, legendarily hid numbers in his compositions to sort of etch numerical initials directly into them. 
like little signatures for music analysts years later to obsess over. In 1979, Kit Williams published Masquerade, a picture book of incoherently detailed illustrations. The blurb stated that, concealed within the pages, is the location of an 18 carat gold rabbit jewel, buried somewhere in England. It became the best-selling children's book before the release of Harry Potter 18 years later. These are puzzles, treasure hunts, connecting dots and drawing lines. They have an answer. Whether that be a hidden name or a buried jewel, that is obvious to everybody. That is known. The lecture carries on, each point bleeding into the next while the beginnings of the solar eclipse shift along the screen over the course of the hour. Then, I am told of the speaker's first-hand encounter with an insane conspiracy theorist, someone who is looking for things that are not really there, a person so encapsulated by the truth that he comes across as a joke. They laugh at him and his pointless exercise, they poke holes and apply his logic to things that even he can tell is ridiculous. Conspiracy theories can truly be dangerous, spread distrust and create divides between people with lies and false information. But what if something is actually found? Who wrote Shakespeare? The essays and books devoted to the Shakespeare authorship problem are sufficient to fill a large library. Several such libraries actually exist. It's not fully known whether William Shakespeare, a farmer's son in the small Midwestern English village of Stratford-upon-Avon, did really write the plays titled with his name, or whether he existed at all for that matter. What is known is that it's extremely unlikely that a man who grew up in a mostly illiterate village could have the sheer encyclopedic knowledge to write about all the topics of the works of Shakespeare, a man who couldn't even spell his own name consistently. There's an almost endless amount of writings dedicated to the secrets within the works of William Shakespeare and the other great historical story collection in Western history, the Bible. In the late 18th century, James Wilmot began the quest for the real identity of Shakespeare and somehow found that it could only have been Francis Bacon, a high counselor of the court of England at the time. Michael Dronson wrote the Bible Code in 1998 explaining how he applied a skip cipher to the Hebrew text of the Old Testament and supposedly found prophecies predicting World War II, the Holocaust, Hiroshima, the moon landing and more culturally pivoting events of modern times. Searches into the Bible also date back hundreds of years into Hebrew tradition. Around the turn of the 20th century, Dr. Orville Owen constructed an absurd research device to find an entire new history of Elizabethan England within Shakespeare's work. It was called the Wheel of Fortune, the designs of which were revealed to him from a secret verse hidden in more of Shakespeare's writings. Before Owen, Delia Bacon from Stratford, Connecticut, began the Shakespeare hunt with a book titled The Philosophy of the Plays of Shakespeare Unfolded. Here she claimed the works of Shakespeare were written by a secret group as containing well Sir Francis, Francis Bacon. Bacon. Delia Bacon's book electrified the world of letters. She was catapulted into 19th century fame. The third video of the theater room is the final 12 minutes of Andrei Tarkovsky's Nostalgia. A man attempts over and over again to walk across a drained hot spring with a lit candle. If it goes out, he must walk back and try again. As he gets closer to achieving his goal with each attempt, his walk falls to a shuffle, then a stumble, and eventually he has to drag himself forward to place the candle on the other side. Only then does he finally die. Then the camera spends an entire three minutes slowly zooming out of that same man sitting by a pond near a house with a dog by his side. He is staring directly at me. As the shot progresses, the perspective warps into this impossible world inside of a massive chapel ruin. The words, dedicated to the memory of my mother, appear on the screen in Italian, and the clip ends. Watching the full two-hour film of Nostalgia is what I can only describe as enthrallingly vivid, yet dull in a way that diseased and faded film only can be. It's an endlessly evocative masterpiece about uncomfortable alien worlds, homesickness, failed love, some very odd children, and for its connection to the witness, the sinking feeling of insanity. Leaving his family in Russia, writer Andrei Gorkachev journeys to a remote village in the Tuscany countryside in Italy to research an 18th century Russian composer who stayed there once before committing suicide after he returned home. 
Once there, Andre meets Domenico, a strange man perceived by the rest of the town's small population as absolutely mad. Once pushed by Andre, Domenico opens up about his obsessions. He once trapped his family inside his house to save them from the supposed end of the world. What that entailed is left unknown. His family had not been outside the walls of their rotting home for seven years before the police finally freed them. Domenico chased his now free, now running boy down the twisting streets that he had never seen before and out onto a cliff face above a stunning vista. Domenico was so afraid of this ambiguous, impending cataclysm that he locked away his entire world to protect it from the outside. Now, after being thrust out to live in a collapsing building when the asylum's closed, Domenico has nothing else to live for, so he says he must carry a lit candle from one end of the hot spring at the heart of the village to the other, and then the world will be saved. But he's an outcast. The other villagers won't let him go anywhere near the baths as they think he is trying to drown himself. He begs Andre to do it for him. And some part of the insanity of the village is implanted in Andre like a seed. Between the beats of the story, reality begins to slip. The camera will just linger, unwavering, upon the bizarre world the characters are drifting through. The detail is just immense. Some of the shots have an almost overwhelming amount of stuff. The camera hyper-zooms in, dizzyingly close to materials. The world has an unfiltered, ungraded purity of texture. Would it be that strange if I said I could feel every molecule of water as they stagnate in this decaying ruin? Or each photon of light as it reflects off the surface? This quiet, sublime stress ebbs and flows like an undercurrent throughout the film. The unknown pressure that seems to linger in the back of the characters' minds is projected into the crumbling world around them through the eroding rain and the seeping noise grain baked into the audio of the film that raises and raises to unbearable levels. I only notice these abrasive pressures rising until a second before they disappear, snapping to the next lucid event. From the very beginning, the film loves to use distant shots of the characters, where faces are indistinguishable from the outline of their forms. At the start, these techniques expertly build the captivating, excruciating atmosphere of nostalgia. But nearing the end, they are dread. The landscape itself causing madness within Andre. These characters, now with complete, excruciating understanding of the mental unravelling they are in the process of, are hopelessly alone in the face of oblivion. They sink into the environments and yet still defiantly are there. They draw my eyes and never let me look away from how broken they are. It's a sad acceptance of madness and distance, manifested in seeking answers, seeking resolutions, externalised to horror. After huge debates over Shakespeare's identity in the global literary community, Delia Bacon finally travelled to Stratford-upon-Avon and gained permission to open Shakespeare's grave. However, just before lifting the stone, her self-doubt caused a crippling nervous breakdown. She later died penniless in a madhouse. Around Insanity eight. normally brings an end to things. Orville Owen spent 15 years and thousands of dollars excavating the bed of the River Wye after he discovered an anagram indicating Francis Bacon's original manuscripts were buried beneath the waters. Consumed by regret for throwing away his career, reputation and health for the search, he became bedridden. Explosives. He died before anything was found. In Understand, as Leon lives his life of purest thought, dealing only with the outside world when absolutely necessary, a temptation lingers in the back of his endless sifting mind, and a frustration at its limits. If he can just get another dose of the hormone, then what further beauty could he conceptualize? He knows this is dangerous. Another injection could kill him or drive him to insanity. He takes the risk anyway. The possibility of further enlightenment is too irresistible to ignore. So he steals an ampule of the stuff and injects himself. My brain is on fire. My spine burns through my back. I feel near apoplexy. I am blind. Death. Insensate. 
After the racking pains subside, his mind reaches a critical mass, a state of complete meta-understanding and self-programming, and the gestalt of his mind begins to clear. Now it's possible to understand the absolute sublimity of everything in the universe. He is hanging on to this edge by a razor thread, almost at sheer madness. But before he can achieve his enlightenment, where all knots and lines will align into a most wonderful pattern, he meets another like him. This other being, Reynolds, is concerned contrastingly with using his ability to achieve peace and happiness in the human world, a compassion Leon doesn't feel at all. They cannot coexist, the world is literally not big enough for the both of them to achieve their goals. And so they fight, a confrontation of godlike minds. After this absolutely insane battle composed of strikes of pheromones and neuron programming, Reynolds employed his final attack. From studying other humans, by forging connections, he knows how to plant subconscious triggers and destroys Leon with a single word. The story ends. I dissolve. At the end of Nostalgia, Domenico delivers a speech to a public audience about how people must return to a world when life was not so awash with impurities, without fault and anguish, not so inseparable from suffering and then he sets himself on fire. People die sometimes horrific deaths, pass away without satisfaction and leave homes empty. Others try to prevent them from dying. Eugenia, Andre's Italian interpreter, suggests that he returns home to his family. He says he will, but after being reminded of his diminishing health, he finally makes up his mind to abandon the memory of home and finish what his friends started. He carries the candle. At the end, he passes away from that health condition. But it's explicit what really killed him, what ate him up from the inside. Technically, Leon kills himself. The single word spoken by Reynolds, understand, just sets in motion an unraveling in his mind, revealing a chain of links, a lethal domino track, utterly destroying him. All Reynolds did was tug at a thread, unlock a door, these people are irrevocably lost. They have become so consumed in someone else's world. They were trapped in a labyrinth of delusion, mining order from chaos, anglers in a lake of darkness. Lear, Act 3, Scene 6. You would think that free it's basically undisputed that the King James Bible and the works of Shakespeare are the two most influential sets of historical English literature to exist. They played a huge part in the development of Western culture throughout the centuries since their creation. And the secret of Psalm 46 is all too aware of this fact. Like it or not, all of us peer at the world through the lenses of these great works. These pieces of art are rooted in, well, the culture of a large fraction of the world. They are part of the fabric of our society, language and politics. No wonder then there are so many desperate expeditions into this colossal abyss, so many falls into the traps that great things leave in their wake. Contemplating these dazzling jewels of wisdom and eloquence gives rise to an extraordinary feeling, a potent, rare, and precious emotion with the potential to completely upset your life. An emotion powerful enough to make a man abandon his wife and children, forfeit career and reputation, lay down his possessions, and follow his heart without questioning. That sweet, sweet fusion of wonder and fear, irresistible attraction and soul-numbing dread known as awe. Or as Moriarty makes terribly clear, is the driving force behind the journeys into long, dead worlds. It's hard to fathom the holes I could punch into something until it becomes terrifying to look at. And so I pick at the stitches, and it all falls apart, shattering, shimmering. A plaque on the case identifies this book as a first edition of the King James Bible, published in 1611 when Shakespeare was 46. In the year 1900, a scholar noticed something 
about the King James translation of Psalm 46. Something terrifying, something wonderful. The 46th word from the beginning of Psalm 46 is shake. The 46th word from the end is spear. There are only two possibilities here. Either this is the finest coincidence ever recorded in the history of world literature, or it is not. The Earth revolves around only one sun and has only one moon. The moon happens to be 400 times smaller than the sun. The sun happens to be 400 times farther away. And the apparent paths of the moon and sun in our sky happen to intersect exactly twice every month. Which means that every now and then, at long yet precisely predictable intervals, the lunar disk slips across the face of the sun and just barely conceals it for a few wonderful, terrible minutes. A fine coincidence, no? The relation between the controller and the controlled is reciprocal. The scientist in the laboratory studying the behavior of a pigeon designs contingencies and observes their effects. His apparatus exerts a conspicuous control on the pigeon, but we must not overlook the control exerted by the pigeon. The behavior of the pigeon has determined the design of the apparatus and the procedures in which it is used. Some such reciprocal control is characteristic of all science. As Francis Bacon put it, nature, to be commanded, must be obeyed. The scientist who designs a cyclotron is under the control of the particles he is studying. The behavior with which a parent controls his child, either aversively or through positive reinforcement, is shaped and maintained by the child's responses. A psychotherapist changes the behavior of his patient in ways which have been shaped and maintained by his success in changing that behavior. A government or religion prescribes and imposes sanctions selected by their effectiveness in controlling citizen or community. An employer induces his employees to work industriously and carefully with wage systems determined by their effects on behavior. The classroom practices of the teacher are shaped and maintained by the effects on his students. In a very real sense, then, the slave controls the slave driver, the child, the parent, the patient, the therapist, the citizen, the government, the communicant, the priest, the employee, the employer, and the student, the teacher. B.F. Skinner, 1971. Any warning or structural justification, the fugue stops, dead in its tracks. One of the composer's 20 children, his son Carl Philip Emanuel, claimed that Bach died moments after those last few notes were written. This story is probably apocryphal. The Easter eggs in Bach's music are a pleasant obscurity, known chiefly to professors and students of Baroque music. But in March of 2002, when this lecture was first delivered, those Easter eggs were the talk of the entire classical music.
Uh, my name is Jonathan Blow. I'm a game designer from the USA, and the most recent game that I designed was this Dang game, serene The Witness, at the Crowd of the Crowd One day, on the floor of the Reeves, I am a jewel of our masquerade, which lies waiting to save the inside of me. Good friend, for Jesus' sake, Forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be the man who spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. The Secret of Psalm 46 is a lecture by Brian Moriarty that begins with secrets that have answers. Then it descends into secrets that only have answers in the worlds of the mad. And then it's about... truth? Secrets that do exist but have no answer behind them. And what do I do with that? That. That's the horror. It's the horror of not knowing causality from coincidence. It's the horror of finding myself searching for that answer. It's the horror of watching a half black and white Russian film set in Italy about losing yourself in obsession, and finding that I am analysing every little detail. It's the horror of watching an hour-long lecture in the dark night about hidden coincidences after a day full of secret searching within a video game about drawing lines onto grids, and I recognise that I am nothing against the giants of art and in some sadistically pretentious way. I am trapped. No one is free. Brian Moriarty himself, in a lecture years later, said, The Witness is an unprecedented, ludic fugue which aspires to be nothing less than a concentration machine capable of evoking supercritical insight. He sees the secrets put in there only for him to get. References to inside jokes with blow. Gratitude for inspiration. All put in there for him. I am trapped in the island. There is no turning back. The door has been bolted behind me. I don't remember if I was given a warning. In 2015, Stanley Parable creator Davey Rendon released The Beginner's Guide. It's one of the most thought-provoking and powerful things I have ever experienced. It's a lot. Like a lot, a lot. Led by Davey as the narrator, you're taken through a series of short walking games made by a person called Coda. Davey explains that these seemingly random projects, when analysed together, will tell us about Coda's life, about who he was, and why his work is special. However, as the game progresses, and the true nature of the story reveals itself, one aspect of an interpretation of the beginner's guide feels, well, familiar. Davey sees these connections and meanings in Coda's games, not because they are there, but because he wants them to be there. He thinks that a centralised meaning deserves to unite the projects. Why else does he feel these things when he plays them? And he needs to be the one to find that meaning. While the context around it and the effects upon the characters and the stress of these worlds that they have built are completely different to this starkly blank puzzle game, I think there is some shared understanding here. A need to find something to find meaning in. For Davy, it's a connection. The feeling of being needed while he attempts to help someone he thinks has serious depression. And I guess, in some unequal yet unavoidable way, for me playing The Witness, it's the connection between the game, itself, and reality. Self-referencing in endless loops. Davey wants to search so badly that he edits Coda's games to create something there. He builds a false truth, a comforting, selfish truth. And like, isn't that what I've found here? An obsession with searching for my own truth in a piece of art that exists unwavering without my knowledge of it. Finding connections that aren't there, and don't need to be there. Coda's games are Coda's games. Davy doesn't get it. He literally cannot understand life without validation that he's doing something right. As he pushes and forces himself into Coda's life, he forces this concept of a prison upon Coda. That Coda is trapped in some sort of depressive cycle and that he needs to be saved. In doing so, he breaks the trust they had, and Coda stops creating. 
As Davy eventually becomes all too aware of what he did, he stops talking himself. One of the most memorable parts of the beginner's guide for me is this lonely room just before the ascension of the ending. Without Coda's games and something to feel something in, Davy is forced to keep going. He trails off as I walk up this zigzagging path and just leaves me to go forward on my own in a world where everyone has disappeared. It's not clear who made this place now. Coda, Davy, the files themselves, me. While these games couldn't be more different in emotion and themes, I think that a part of the beginner's guide is the witness, weaved and interconnected into a truly moving experience of the intimate relationship between art, artist, and audience. It's a shape of the island that's more understandable, but one that's so unique and wrenching. So, if you'll indulge me a little longer, I'd like to collect a story. Tu conosci grandi storie d'amore, classico, niente baci, niente baci, niente di niente, purissimi. Ecco perché è grande. I sentimenti non espressi, non si dimenticano. Qui come in Russia. Non so perché. Non so. An island rests somewhere out in the infinite blue. Blank ruins and bright orchids and broken machinery sleep along its shores in gentle curves. They haven't been alive for a long time, yet dust settles nowhere, nothing erodes. Flowers bloom in the fields, fountains trickle in the lake, and trees stand in a multitude of shapes and hues, yet never change. There are the remains of people, statues, frozen in action or solace. The island is a snapshot of endless time, a frozen frame. Something has happened here, but also nothing has ever happened, and also something is just about to start, a draw of new breath. The statues are archaeologists, painters, townspeople, madmen, researchers, politicians, and victims. They lived during, before, and after this world existed. Structures here vary from ancient temples to wasting towns to pristine labs, still with perfectly cut plant life, yet their concrete walls have rotted through. An aftermath, explosion, and causation all at the same time. At the furthest point of the island is a sea cave. The salty blue water is too flat as it fills the cavern and wraps around the bases of its perfect stone arches. The sun, never moving, casts long afternoon shadows into the space. A stone woman huddles off to the side, her child held close. She stares at the elevator. Has it already left in her world, or is she still watching someone leave? The boy beside her is unaware of his mother's grasp. His eyes are fixated just to the left of her line of sight. A crashed boat lingers upon the rocks beyond. What were they searching for? under the lull of the waves. The boy holds a toy sailing boat, arm outstretched and join his frozen eyes. He wants to follow his father, wherever he might have gone. Neither can do anything. They are stone. Across the island, panels sprout like stains, an infestation. But the island is dependent on them to remain to create life and motion wherever it can. And so the island sways to the panels, twisting and contorting to replicate what it's been taught. The mind begins to shift and change to the will of the lines. The Witness is a game about prisons. The lines are prisons. The island is a prison. The statues, ideas, words are prisoners. And later, prisons for me. The Witness is a game about the prisons that I, that you, that we all construct around ourselves as we fall into the island. 
the prisons of helplessness as we watch people fall into their own. Now, please don't come away from this lecture thinking that the key to awesome game design is the installation of Easter eggs. Is our imagination so impoverished that we have to resort to marketing gimmicks to keep players interested in our games? Awesome things don't hold anything back. Awesome things are rich and generous. The treasure is right there. I don't know what The Witness is. Only a small percentage of people have gotten this far into the madness, and I sincerely doubt that there will be one last huge reveal just out of reach from all of us. I don't think it's that game that will flash across our culture like lightning, as Moriarty foretold. It didn't. The Witness was a success, but it's not the cultural pivot point of the medium. Is Jonathan Blow a lie? Maybe. But one thing I am sure of is that we have found things. There's a video on YouTube simply called Drawing the Line by the channel Titus. It's a sort of series of vignettes of people talking about things. Art, film, music, stories, cut to sweeping shots of the island and puzzles aligned like ancient glyphs. Some of the words spoken can be said to be previously related to the game. Some clearly were not but now irreversibly are by the impalpable nature of the video. I love it. It makes very little sense. It says that this is the truth. For just a moment, all the connections in the witness are real, and for just a moment it asks, isn't it awful? Isn't it beautiful? The Witness is a game about perspectives, it's about science, it's about religion, it's about music and architecture and gardens and secrets and easter eggs and prisons and Shakespeare and orbits and humanity and nature and peace and love and death and puzzles. God, it's pretentious, but hell if it isn't beautiful to look at. It allows for a search unburdened by deep human emotions and never undermined by how ridiculous it gets. It's a love of pure, recursive analysis for the sake of it. It can't last forever, so we enjoy it while we're here. When we leave that jewel for eternity, we feel part of that experience stay with us, and part of us remain on those shores. There's a difference in that relationship between you and that planet, and you and all those other forms of life on that planet, because you've had that kind of experience. It's a difference, and it's so precious. And all through this, I've used the word you because it's not me. It's not Dave Scott. It's not Dick Gordon, Pete Conrad, John Glenn. It's you. It's us. It's we. It's life. It's had that experience, 
And it's not just my problem to integrate. It's not my challenge to integrate, my joy to integrate. It's yours. It's everybody's. Russell Schweikart, 1975.